So I will try to provide a bit of a historical background. Some, most of the data is published. So if you don't get it here, you can read the papers. There are a few new things that are on the way out that is a bit more recent, just to make it more fun. And I will normally, when I give you this talk, I probably spend half of it talking about AlphaFold, but I guess people here know what AlphaFold is. So I will be very, very short of that. But I will start with the key point that actually, what are we doing we, when we do structure prediction analysis? We all, almost all start from a multiple sequence alignment. We nowadays also start from a language model sometimes, but the assumption is somehow that we use a multiple sequence alignment. And the key information here is, of course, we look at pairs of columns or sets of columns, and we try to find some type of correlation between this. And we do believe that these infer some kind of structural information, that they are most likely in contact or at least somehow have some structural information in them. And we can do that. And this method was initially developed by Alfonso. I don't know if he's in the room now, but um, in the mid 90s. And uh, then, of course, it didn't really work very well, but it was better than random, but did not have any provided a lot of extra values. And then in 99, Lapidis showed that you could use indirect information to improve it, but nobody remembered that paper basically until mainly Martin White and other people in like 2008, 2009 started reinventing this direct coptic analysis. And this led that you could actually do accurate enough contra predictions to do structure predictions. You could add, this is an example from some cast target and you can predict the contact map, see the contact map up here. Uh, and the, the, in this case, the green predicts are correct, the red ones are wrong, and the gray ones are missed. And you can do that to predict the structure. In this case, it's not that bad. This has a TM score of 0.74. And uh, the key thing here was that it worked quite well if you had a lot of sequences. But it's also something you can think about is that the contact map, as well as the MSA, certainly has patterns. They're not randomly distributed contacts. They are patterns because they are representing a photo structure. And patterns is, of course, what machine learning is excellent to find. So the next step was when we got rid of, we start at least ignoring more of the direct uh, coupling analysis and went on to machine learning. So that improved things like that until uh, we were in CASP 13. And it was a really big jump in performance. So CASP 13 was like uh, five years ago. And suddenly, AlphaFold 1 was introduced. And you can see this is the classical CASP picture where you have like all the targets a bit uh, uh, divided by from easy to hard, or easy to difficult. And you had the GDTTS, so the performance basically between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100. So, and like 90 is more or less experimental quality. So the, you can see from CASP 1 to CASP 13, in the easy targets has been a minimal improvement. But for the harder targets, we didn't see improvement. And then there was a jump for the hard targets in CAS 13. And uh, this is an example of predictions made by DeepMind about full one. That looks pretty good, I would say. It's not perfect. You can see still that the loops are different. I think they're not perfect, but and the certain term are a bit different. One, but at least the overall folds for quite big proteins is, are clearly quite okay. So we sat down and we just did some work on that. We also developed our own methods and so on. And we thought about. What can we do? What did we learn from this? Of course, we, we learned that it was quite clear, at least single domains of proteins, we could already then predict with quite high accuracy. There were still some problems. We worked on repeat proteins and thought that could work. But would, even that worked much better with these new methods. If you need if you some tricks. So, but we realized also the next big problem that we're going to do on is not working on single proteins, but it's going to be work on interactions. So we focused on the work on interactions. And you can do the same thing. I mean, already Martin White did that before in uh, um, uh, in the whole Spadlian problems. And people worked on that already before, but we tried to do it a bit more systematically. So we took, uh, the, and the key problem, what you need to do then, is that you need to match alignments. You need to, if you have a, if you have a multiple six alignment, it's easy because you know every line is, this, is related to a protein. And you have either an amino acid or a gap there. But if you have one predict the interaction with two proteins, you need to make sure that these two proteins, so then you have two, two sets of lines, and you don't know really which protein interacts with which one. So if it's a very easy system where you have only one copy of protein family A and one copy of protein family B in every single genome, you just take them and match them. It's easy. But we know we have a lot of paralogs. We have a lot of copies of them, of the proteins. We know that it can be different ways of interacting. You can have 
five pair logs, they might interact one by one very specifically. They might interact all to one, they might all interact with each other. And that, of course, will, will uh, influence our uh, matching of sequences and, in fact, match our correlation depending on how we match them together. So we tried, so there are, there are people who have done that before, and people have tried to do that. And the easy way to do it is basically is that you take you only the, you take you have the two creator proteins, and you only take the top hit from each proteome, and then you match them together. Because that's most likely the orthologs, and orthologs are most likely being interacting in the same way. It's not perfect, but it sort of works. So we did that and uh, developed a method based on TR Rosetta. So we just took two sequences. We merged the MSAs. We put in a small glycine link in between them, just to not confuse with the edge effects. And we did a structure prediction. So this is the case, or, or, well, we did a, cont or a distance prediction for TR Rosetta, just plugged into TR Rosetta. And uh, then you could fold the proteins and uh, dock it simultaneously. We call it fold and dock. So basically, we do not, it's not a classical dock. We take two protein structures that are docked together and put them together. We really fold and dock together. And TR Rosetta basically, you do basically do any minimization from uh, the predicted distances, and then you just put it into in Rosetta or into CNS. You can use a number of various programs there. And then finally, we need to have some kind of scoring. And like in every other method, like often consensus or like basically clustering is a good way to score things. So basically, we generated number models. And if they all were the same, it was most likely a good model. If they all were different, it was most likely a bad model. Like that's is it, that's what Rosetta has used for years, and that's what we are used for uh, scoring predictions also for years. So, so, so we developed we call it PCOS doc, and this sort of worked. So it has had some progress, but so in some cases it worked quite well. So this is the case we had a nice prediction. You can see the uh, all, when the map between the native and the that is, that is correct, and you can see the on the top half you see the real contact prediction on the bottom half you see the predicted one and this in this case they are quite similar i think we have a, a ppv of 80 percent of the predictions are correct but in many cases it doesn't work when I mean, you got the individual proteins were still nicely folded but the docking didn't work so you didn't and in this case it was mostly because you had no predicted short range distances in the interface between the two proteins there were very few, or sometimes they were wrong. And there also sometimes there were artifacts occurring there sometimes. But it was, it really didn't work. So, but it was at least, it, it worked sometimes. And we know that Docker was a hard problem, so we managed to publish this. And we compared it to other methods, like uh, uh, FFT-based docking or templates-based docking and so on. And the performance is, in all cases, pretty bad. You have like 10, 15% success rate maximum. But at least it's orthogonal, so at least it adds some value to it. So in this, you see the cases up in the uh, le left corner, we have models that are uh, well predicted by us, but badly predicted by the other methods. So at least there are some examples, but still it's far away from a solved problem. And then we come to CAS14, and of course we all realize that Alpha Fold 2 uh, appeared and suddenly performance just jumped. And luckily for us and the community, DeepMind made the code available and the software available. So it's like one of the big contributions to the field. So otherwise, I guess we would have been far behind. So it was really, uh, really, really nice decision. So of course, we realized that we could do the same thing. Uh, so basically, you can do the same thing. You take two MSAs, you put merge them together in some way. I will go back to what I did that together, and you plug it into AlphaFold. And luckily, AlphaFold was trained in a way that had the rescue numbers. In them. So you could just add 100 or 200 to the rest of the numbers, and you get into two chains instead of one chain. But you notice in this case, AlphaFold 1 or AlphaFold 2.0, whatever it's called, it's not the multi version, it's not trained on multi merge, it's only trained on single chains. So it has never ever seen an interaction to change together. So that this is this is sort of like a, a bit of challenging test that it doesn't work because then it has to have learned something about that. It, I mean, so it's also the training set. Certainly, you could you could imagine that you have things that are, I mean, I mean that are 
fused proteins that has been seen and you can see that learner. But in general, it has never seen two chains separately. So we, and it was other people, there was a lot of activity on Twitter and people putting glycine linkers and people putting different things. And it was not, we who discovered that you could put this just a gap. It was, it was, yeah, it was, it was out there. So it was an intense two weeks during uh, summer of pandemia. So it was kind of fun. But then of course we realized we could do the same thing and you can run it with a, uh, standard MSA, so you can actually just merge the two proteins and run an MSA, and sometimes this is what you get. If I can get the pointer here, mm. maybe there. Pointer, let's say, yeah. That so now, yeah. So, so if you, sometimes actually, of course, you get proteins and match the two uh, different uh, uh, that scans both protein, protein A and protein B. So there are could have fused proteins in the database, or you have error in the matches. So yeah, sometimes you get things covered. But most of the hits gonna be on either the first protein or the second protein. So in this case, if you do that, you get a bad model. It doesn't overlap at all. You can also do the same pairing as we've done before, just use the same algorithm. And in this case, you also get a bad model. But we notice that if you put them both together, in this case, you got a good model. You could also imagine to actually run protein A and protein B separately and just put them like a diagonal. You have empty cases here. And actually, surprisingly, in some cases, you get a good model there also, because you have actually you have no information from the sequence on how you should interact. But in general, it doesn't work good. But we tried all these things, and we showed that basically the more information you put in, the better you do. So first, you can say that in general, this is this is the probably key slide here. So this is DOCQ, which is the score between zero and one of quality of docking that Björn Wallner developed. And uh, Often 0.23 is the cutoff for an acceptable model. That's, I can sort of agree on that. Uh, and you see that all metals basically have very, very few models that are higher than 0.23. And uh, even Rosetta Fold here, we've got bad models. Right? If you run Alpha Fold default, we have still, we have 43% of the models are correct, which is way better than anything else earlier. We had maybe 15% earlier, anything better. But the average score is quite low. But we see that we, if you use this paired alignment, and particularly if you use the paired and the F2 model, model alignments, and we increase it, you know, some, we did several models, we took the top ranked one, we could increase it to almost 60%, which is quite good. So like it's an average like 0.3 or docus, which is much, much higher than anything else before. So this is really, it's a big step up from all earlier work. And uh, yeah, so we, we then we asked, like, we still, it's 60% is not 100%. So we asked, when does it work and when does it not work? So we went back to our old methods and asked uh, if we run PLM DCA, because of all, all the DCA methods, and do we find some, uh, on the same MSAs, do we find some contact or not? So basically, do I have a coevolution between these products or not? So the blue ones is the cases where we have no coevolutions and the green and yellow ones are the ones where we have coevolutions. You see, if you have no coevolution signal, it's very few proteins that we get good prediction from. If you use uh, the pad alignment, so basically all are wrong. If you use the blocked alignment, if you merge the alignments together, if you use both pad blocked, it increases a bit. So still, it's like some part that we get good results. But in every case, of course, if we have a coevolution signal, we are more successful. So really, the key thing is still to find, in most cases, find a coevolution signal, although it works some cases even without it. I guess the signal is very strong, or it is a fused protein that's seen in a database, or something else. It's something it has learned. Okay, so the next step we did was actually to try to develop a, a scoring function. So we, we, we tried to say, do we know if, it, if the prediction is good or prediction is bad? So we want to predict this docu value. When you had, in Alpha Fold 1, you didn't have any score for it because we only predicted the TM score of everything together, which of course we could have used, but we realized it was not that good because that's, it's very dependent on the size of the proteins. If one protein is big, you can have a good TM score and the other one is small, it's not seen. So we just found a simple score that if you look, basically if you have a bigger interface with higher predicted quality, then you get a better score. So we had, we looked at that and looked at the interface context, we took a log of it, we multiplied it by the average interface PLDT, so predicted local distance test. And we could do that, and then we, we could fit the sigmoidal curve to it, and you could basically say, get a score between zero and one. So basically, if you're higher than 0.5 or 0.2, something like that, you have a good model. If you lower, you're a bad model. 
And we found that this, I mean, this was a quite useful tool, so it was like usually predicted. And we saw that this was a useful tool to separate good and bad models. The area on the curve is something like uh, 0.80, no, 0.95, so it's pretty good separation. If you add the scores, we tried this, and we saw the four things, it's like 0.6, something like that. So it's like, it's pretty good. But, and we also noticed that in another test that it's good at separating binding and non-binding proteins. So this means that we could use it for large scale. If it, if it holds on, it could use for large scale um, scanning if two proteins interact or not. So that's sort of, you see that it's not really going up to one here. So like, we're not gonna get everything. The two positive rate is never going to be 100%, but it's going to be maybe if you good cutoff, it's going to be 60 70%. So we're not, we're not going to find all interactions, but we're going to find a, a significant number of interactions with very low false positive rate, which I guess is the key thing. So we, not, we not, never claim to cover everything. So uh, now lately, so this is a bit new data, we have done this on the alpha multimere. And one problem we have here is, of course, that we had to define what, what is a good scoring for if you have a multimere. So if you have, do you want to look at the best score of each chain? Do you want to look at the overall score and things like that? So we tried a lot of different things. At the end, it doesn't really matter so much because they are kind of strongly correlated. But uh, there are of course, there are differences. So again, if you look at TM score, you look at everything. If you look at DOCQ, you look at after one score, one chain's interaction with everything else. And we sort of choose the second one. So our definition of a good model is when every single model is good. Every single chain is good in, when you look at that. However, there are complexes. So one example is like, do you think this is a good model or a bad model? So certainly the interface is perfect. You can look at like the interface score is, is very good. And the problem is like one of the proteins is pretty wrong. So is this a good docking or is it no, not a good docking? It's like that's basically the docu score is actually pretty good, 0.3. Uh, if you look at the, the TM score of the ligand, the smaller protein, is excellent, but it's bad for the receptor, the big protein. So if you look at look at the TM score, if you suppose one and the other one, you get a good score for one and bad score for the other one. So it, it's a little bit what you should do. But these, these cases are quite rare. So on average, they are all models, all methods are strongly correlated. So we just picked the minimum doc score for one chain in the as a default cutoff. So we did that, and uh, we did it for a set of proteins that are newer, uh, that was not seen by alpha-following training, it's a new set of proteins, and they are from two to six chains. And one thing we noted was that if you do that, and you look at we have homomeres and heteromeres, before we only had heteromeres, so for homomeres, you either get everything correct or nothing. Basically, It's very rare that you get on the one chain wrong. So often they're symmetrical. So often you get it right or you get it completely wrong. However, for heteromeres, it's in one third of the cases, more or less, you get some of the models, some of the chains incorrect while the others are correct. Or so it's a one third, everything is correct. And one third is one, one or two chains missing. And one third, none of them are correct. So it's, but for homomeres, it's, it's either all or nothing. And so, so we did this benchmark, and we looked at the, if you look at the docu score to, to the right, uh, you see that for two males, we have like, yeah, you have a large set of good models and a small set of bad models. Uh, so it's uh, clearly, I mean, as I said before, more than 60, about 60% 60 of the models are good, and both for homomeres and heteromeres. So it's a bit uh, worse for homomeres for some reason. But then, you see it drops, particularly for the heteromers. So like if you go up to five, six chains, it drops down to like 20, 30% correct models. Or I think it's 40% or something like that. For homomers, it's a bit higher. It's like 50, 50, because the cutoff is like 0.2 here. So you see you have a, it, it drops for bigger proteins. It gets more, it gets harder here, clearly. But it still is quite impressive. And, and some, it's a bit notable, some of the cases where, where we think we're wrong, you, we are a bit suspicious of, so of that really the crystal structure is correct. There are cases where you have a very good score and it makes more biological sense to trust the alpha fold prediction than actually the crystal structure. So it's not, but it's hard to prove, but it's like, it, 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 we are pretty convinced that there are some cases, like, not all cases, but there are cases like that. So if you have a very good score from alpha fold, I would trust it as much as I would try the crystal structure. Uh, yeah, so here's the success rate, so down to like, 
40 percent more or less for hexamer for pentamers for some reason the heteromers are harder because they're no symmetric they're less symmetric ones uh, we can also notice that the language models that Berker talked about yesterday does not work for, for protein protein interactions they are not completely useless they're down to like 10 feet of percent they're probably better than anything else but they are clearly not good for protein protein, protein interactions and, it, and it's not that st strange to think about it because so what does the language model do a language model sort of learn information from the msa so it learns that like to get um, this residue and this residue here if they are in contact they're going to have a tension held between them so it learns that these two are important for each other because the tension held is going to be stronger there between them but if you have like, two different proteins they, 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 they can never learn it because they're never trained you never have an interaction trained like that so if there was some copy that data you could train it on interactions it would be very useful like if true but then you maybe could learn it but like it is not learned like that so it's the only case it is learned is maybe when there are proteins that are fused together so they sort of infer from that somehow but it really has, doesn't have this information so it's not surprising so unfortunately ESM fold or omega fold does not work for this, for this type of studies which would be great but, but it they don't um, we also noticed that this P dot Q was not very good in this for the alpha fold multimer. So we have here, you have a problem that you have like actually quite a lot of false positives. So you have a high scoring models. So we developed a version two of it, which is actually using these PAEs from alpha fold multimer. We need to use them. Otherwise it doesn't work. So this is, we do that and you have not much higher correlation, but much more smooth distribution. So like it's clearly better. And it works both for homomers and heteromers. So if people, I know people are using P doc Q version one for alpha multimer or for more than two chains, there is a reason that you have a false positive there because you basically they are the reason is probably because alpha fold multimer likes to put things together. It likes to be the model and likes to be a big interface, even if there's no information for it. So that's uh, for the uh, monomer version, it doesn't do it. So that that's 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 the difference. So I would recommend people to use another scoring. You can use in principle you you, you could use the uh, IPTM score, if you, but that is for all the chains together. So, but you had to modify it if you want to get it for one single chain, which you could do, but it's not output by default. Okay, so now we went on to study uh, uh, large interactions. We studied, we took, we did together with Pedro Beltrao, we did a study of two large data sets of human interactions. So, one is URI, which is uh, yeast to hybrid study very very big it's like 65,000 interactions they also anyway they have also added known interactions to the, the data sets and then there's UMAP which is a cool purification study by Ed Marcott and colleagues that is basically taking proteins and cool purifying them if they always appear together they're likely to interact so we know that both of these studies have problems and we know that they behave very differently so we did that if you look at the overall picture if you take things with the structure or all these red lines here are things where we have extra evidence for interactions. They either have structural evidence or we have cross-linking or something like that extra. And you see there, as before, we have about 60% of the models have good PDOX queues and 40% have bad. So that's what you get from PDB more or less. However, if you look at the UMAP too, you get a smaller fraction down here and a high fraction of negative ones, which sort of indicates there's some noise in the data or we are not as good at it or whatever. So we, we have sort of uh, a less, uh, I mean, but, but still it's a big, uh, but if you look at it, to URI, the G2 hybrid data, it's basically nothing that we predict to interact. It's very, very few predictions down here that are highly reliable. So clearly the data sets are very, very different. I wouldn't say that the URI is wrong, but it's clearly it's different. And most likely our guess is that URI picks up transient interactions that are very much more transient, and these are not do not have a strong coevolutionary signal, so, and therefore we cannot pick them up. That's our guess. Anyway, if you take this, you say we can enhance the structural coverage of interactions quite significantly, and Pedro has continued doing that later. So we have a million of predictions nowadays that we can look at, and there are a lot of novel things we can look at and most of them make sense by all or the ones we looked at we can say it makes sense biological one and we also done that for other com from collaboration with other people so we, we get some biology out of this so we have much larger we, we miss some but we get a lot much larger set 
we have done some work recently where people have large scale cross linking data, and it shows that this is quite complementary. It's not quite nice. If you have cross linking data, it's also a bit noisy. But if you can combine the cross linking data with good predictions, you really enhance your data a lot. So you really, this is from our paper, this is from a much larger study recently submitted, that where we have, if you have good P of Q values, the cross linking data is. Um, uh, Enhanced, so you have much more. So it's really a way to like combine them together. So like, I think it's kind of useful. Uh, we look, also look for looked a bit of like what interactions looks like, and we could see that we had looked at some other data sets, and they, be, they behave like UMAP. And we also noticed that a reason why we don't get as high peak from UMAP as we do from PDB is because it separates probably direct and indirect interactions. Like for you do co purifications, you can get down the whole complex. It doesn't mean that a I mean, it can be 10 proofs in this complex, it doesn't mean they all interact together. And we do the same thing for PDB, we take all the big complexes and we look at, we assume that they are, I mean, we take everything in the complex and run together. Of course, if they don't have a direct contact, we don't get the signal. So that's that's the reason why we don't get everything from UMAP to interact, because there are indirect interactions. So we really get the, the direct ones. And we also can see, another thing we actually can see is that if there's a lot of disorder in the protein, we never got a good prediction. And there's much more disorder in, in the uh, in the URI data sets. So the e hybrid proteins picks up much more disordered proteins. That also indicates why there should be trans interaction. So that we need to have an ordered protein to get a good prediction. There are people that don't later have done scanning of disordered regions to bind the proteins like that. You can do it, but not in this large scale one shot, one number thing way. And also, you can say if you have few sequences in you know, the MSA, you also do worse, but that's kind of known. And also, data it was quite clear that if you take a string, co-expressed data, so g text values for that, the ones that have uh, in, in UMAP are much more highly co-expressed than there are ones in URI. And only the ones that are highly co-expressed might have a good prediction. So we are pretty good at, I mean, that's sort of like complementary information from our predictions that is sort of validated somehow. But the interesting thing was when we start looking at networks. So you have a network, you can make a network, you hear the red ones are known interaction, the blue ones are the ones you predict, and you can look at it and you can see this kind of patterns. So you can see like, for instance, here done is a pattern that is very much um, everything interacts with everything. This is the proteasome, so of course, like all the proteins looks very similar and they sort of interact with all together. On the other hand, you have GDI1, which is one protein interacting with many other proteins, but one by one. And they all interact at the same place. So it's really an example of competitive binding. So like the structural information there tells you something about how interactions occur. So like you can, you can learn things from the interaction network. And we focused sort on of this protosome. It gave us an idea like, well, we really have a lot of Paris interactions here. Maybe we can do something with it. So we did that manually in this paper. So we basically took it and we took a protein one first chain and took a prediction and added one more and added one more. So we kept adding all the chains. We did this manually, so we were cheating. We knew the answers. We were cheating a little bit, like we knew the answer. But at the end, we could build the whole proteasome from pairwise interactions. So that's what that's the proof of principle. We did that for a couple of proteins in, in this paper. And it looked nice, and you can do it from other proteins. And you can notice, in some cases, you have monomers that are building a complex. In some cases, you have only a few set of proteins because you have symmetry on it. But in principle, you could represent many of these proteins. If you know the interactions, you can start on building it up together. And it was possible to do that. But this was still manual post-prediction, so you need to know the answer. But Patrick Bryant, my excellent former student, who's soon going to be my colleague, uh, is going to uh, developed this, this method called MOLPC, so my, using Monte Carlo tree structure. So basically, we did this, we picked all against all proteins in a complex, and we used the Monte Carlo tree search. Basically, you try to add things that you can't add more, more things to it, and we do a, uh, we have a simulation of that one, and you do, can do a back propagation, so then you can get a quite efficient way of finding the best way of putting these things together. The reason why you need to pass is basically because what we do is that you start with one chain, and you take another chain, and you do that until you have an overlap, until you collide, something doesn't work anymore. This is, we don't have any other scoring function. We really says we build until it collapses. And, and if every prediction was perfect, it doesn't matter what all you do it. But every prediction is not perfect. So if you do it the wrong way, you start accumulating, accumulating errors, and you, get, and you end up with something that doesn't work. And this multi-color research is a way to do that. 
I think Dina Schneidman has written another method which is more heuristic. It seems to be much better, actually. So there are people who have followed up on that, done more work. But this was uh, earlier. And we thought that it wasn't enough to use dimers. We don't need to use trimers. So basically, the more versions, more, more starting points we have, the better we got. And now we have used tetramers, so that even is even better. But dimers was certainly not enough because you don't have enough possibility to build all combinations done. So, five, eight. So, I don't know, a lot of time. So, uh, at the end, we took complexes with 10 or more chains. And in at those days, these were too big to build with AlphaFold. Now, AlphaFold version 2.3 is much me more memory efficient because it's used BFLOT 16. So, I think we could mo build most of these complexes on a single A100 GPU, at least with 8 gigs memory. Uh, so, but at least in this case, we could get like 23 of these 175 complexes with a team score over 0.9. So you see, these are really good. They really are, I mean, maybe not perfect, but they are, here is one chain X missing, but they are, and you can also see that most of them are symmetrical. So it works quite well with symmetrical models. But it's, it's really, this is really the thing, but this is predictions from the sequence. No, no other information than from sequence. And we basically can build these complexes which would amaze me two years ago, or even more five years ago. And the key thing here is that what we need to have here is, of course, that you have a very good prediction of, of, of the subcomponent. It works. If you have bad prediction of subcomponents, you have uh, uh, a, a bad, uh, you won't get a good prediction. If you have a good, we get a good prediction. This is the key thing you need to do. There's some other things that might work. The symmetry really helps. Uh, in the early version, we had a problem that we need to know the stoichiometry, which we thought was a big problem, because really we have, uh, anyway, you don't know that unless you know the structure, basically. They're very hard in many cases to determine the stoichiometry. You can do some math specs like that, but often you actually know the structure. And, uh, but recently one of my, most students actually, who developed a second version of this, where he just simply ignored adding uh, or removing the chain from uh, the, the set of possible chains when, when you added one more one. So you could actually keep on adding it forever. At least that shows you that in some cases you could predict the stoichiometry also. So you don't even know the stoichiometry. In some cases, like if you have a circular thing, it ends up to become a spir spiral model. So it becomes infinite. So you have to stop sometimes. But like, uh, at least it, it, in a quite a lot of cases, you could, you, you could predict the stoichiometry also. Uh, as I said before, the performance is much better for symmetrical ones. For the asymmetrical ones, it's basically hardly, it's only one model that goes good. But if you have dihedral or cyclic or even octahedral or helical, stoichiometry, well, helical is less, but if you have symmetry, the performance is pretty good. So it really helps for symmetry. Because I guess it's like, yeah. Yeah, mm. and, and we also show that it works for all types of kingdoms. So all, uh, uh, we have bacteria examples, viral examples, eukaryotic examples, and it's not that different. Okay, so I actually, let me go to, but I was acknowledge people and I come back to the last slide in a second. Uh, so Patrick was really the key person here. He did a lot of the works. He's an excellent, he was an excellent student and he is going to start as a group leader in, not in my department, but at Stockholm University in, at the bio, molecular biology department in the next year. And then Gabriele, Benzi and Aditi were doing a large part of these works. Pietras uh, has always helped in everything. And the interaction work was done with Pedro and his team at, well, at those times of EBI nowadays at Zurich. Uh, I want to announce two sets of, first and first, if, if you want to do a PhD or a postdoc with me, just contact me. I have a couple of PhD positions out there and I have money for postdocs. It's, Stockholm is a nice place. It's not that easy to find good postdocs. If you have good postdocs, I'd be very happy. Uh, more importantly, maybe, if you are a postdoc and uh, you want to start your own, team, your own group, we have right now, and probably this is, this is probably the last chance for the next 10 years, if you really want to, to get an extremely good startup position, it's like $1.6 million in, startup, in, in funding. It's a tenure track position. There are 20 of these in Sweden. There are 
two at Stockholm University, and they are in all of them are in data-driven life science. We have one in data-driven cell and molecular biology, and one in data-driven evolution and biodiversity, and there are three other teams, and they are in other places. I think the deadlines are in October, so go to this our homepage and search for careers and the filter on DDLS, and uh, yeah, please apply because I'm or contact me, or talk to me if you're interested because it's. It's a nice place to be. I mean, not only not, not all are in the same place as I am, but there are six positions in the in our center, and there are 14 in the rest of Sweden. And they are, I would say, hard to find as good startups as there in anywhere else, at least in Europe. You have to, you have to be real, and it's, it's it's a good place. So Patrick is coming starting next year. So that's the one example. He's choose to go back. And then finally, I just want to point out. That we have this CASP, so new, I think people know what CASP is, and we have the CASP uh, AI SIGS, so we have machine learning and uh, 3D structure prediction monthly, every the second Wednesday every month at five o'clock Swedish time. So that's, uh, and we have a number of good speakers that are there. So there are, I think, so the CASP community is sort, sort of a close sister to the 3D SIG, I guess. So now we, but now we actually have some activities in between the four, every two years predictions category also, which are quite good seminars. We probably should coordinate it somehow, but this, this is, coordination is sort of more work than you have to do it. So I'm sure there's gonna be some overlap, but it's there, if you're interested in this field, come there. There's also SIGs of RNA structure prediction and of uh, protein, uh, uh, Structure variation in uh, of organized by the people. Okay, and some people gave me money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good stuff, Thank you so much. Have you tried to? I was, I was surprised that you didn't mention Capri, because um, that's a good thing. And, uh, but my question is, have you tried to inform back for the good, for the good predictions based on the PQ score that you develop, to inform back as an extra source of evidence those databases like string or, or sting or a few others uh, of, of the quality that it's likely to be a real direct? Uh, we, we haven't really. I mean, Pedro has done a lot of work like that and later, but it not, not particularly database. I mean, the thing is like, it's still slightly computationally extensive. So like, it's easy to run maybe 10,000 predictions, but if you want to scale up to millions, it gets expensive. It's like, so that, so this was 65,000 and, and, and it was, the, we had quite good access to supercomputers those days. Like, so if you want to scale up, you need to be quite efficient, I think. So that's, that's the reason we haven't done that largely. Sure, sure, but 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 string also could be complete, so it would be a very small subset of it. Because string has, I don't know, tens of millions of, of pairs or something like that. So, so you, you can do. I mean, basically, that's you could say we did this for these two data sets, so like we did it for Yuma and Yuri, which is. But uh, yeah, we have we have done it for Quorum. We run a lot of things for Quorum, which is the manual and annotated data set of complexes, and uh, it's only a few uh, high. Um, Confident predictions that do not have a known structure complete. It's a small subset. It's like a handful we have done. So they have my the papers. There are a few there, but so that's what we focused on. Uh, yes, in, in principle, if alpha fold predicts, so that, that's why we need to, to try uh, not only the dimers, that's why we, we need to predict trimers. Because exactly that's the point. If you have if you have a protein that binds protein A binds to B both here and here, if you only use a dimer, you will only get one of the bindings often. So, so, but if you use a trimer, you can get both. So we, we, we generate a trimer or even a tetramer now, 
and then we did, and then we break it up into dimers. So sort of we, we try to do that that way, and we also generate now 25 models. So, you, you, so basically, if you, more sample you can get. So if AlphaFold can find it, it's there. If AlphaFold cannot find it as a, as part of a dimer trimer, of course we can't do anything because we, then we don't know it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then then we have it. So we have to take the tetramer and we divide, and break it up to, into all dimer combinations and use that. So if it's there, we use it. Okay, I see. <laughs> Amazing work, but uh, I feel a little bit uh, over, over stretch. I mean, the complete structure map. However, we know 20% of the total structure of this order region, which are critical for its function. And uh, I don't think the upper pole can handle the disorder region. So I'd like to guide your comments how to fill in this gap to make good prediction on this other region, which plays critical role in correctness of the multi-domain protein, which are typically linked by the, this other region, and also play critical role in the packing of the multiple protein in the context. So how do you handle this other region? Uh, I f fully agree. I mean, uh, as I would highlight, she says towards us. We, we, don't, we don't claim to make a complete one. And I thought that this is really what I think what we highlight, which if you take the jury study, I mean, I, I'm sure there are experimental problems with these two hybrid, but these are high, highly confident these two have hybrid studies. And we basically find new interactions. And I don't think that they're all wrong. Some are noise, but some are, some, most of them are probably correct. But as I say, these are probably occurring as a transient interaction between likely being disordered regions, and we do not find them. So certainly at the moment, we cannot do much about it. I know people have tried. And the, the, the real reason is why, if you have an interaction between a disorder region, most of it has an ordered protein, and you have a disorder region that is bind there. And it's not, a, it's a very weak co-evolutionary signal. So you really do not have a co-evolutionary signal that, that makes it bind, because you can get many almost random peptide or random disorder regions that bind. And once you have none of this binding and it's crucial, this one is not going, to, not going to evolve at all. It's going to be completely fixed. So you never have a co-evolution signal. So you, it's going to be very hard to do it. Well, yeah, 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 yeah sure, it's flexible. I mean, so at the moment, I don't think we can do it. I mean, it's it's really a challenge. And I, because I don't think we can use co-evolution, because I don't, don't think it exists. And I, mean, I know people have done it. You basically take a disorder region, and you take you scan like, 50 rest of the time, you dock them, and you have some signal. There's something that binds the right place. The peptide docking program that sort of works, but it's it's it's, it's not on a large scale yet because you have to do. I mean, they, you have this AF sample, my Bjorn Valder, for instance, where you, you scan, you may get 6,000 models of peptide proteins, and you, quite often you're correct, but it's really rare. Okay, so can I encourage you to ask questions? Yeah. Yeah. 